Our speaker is Amanda Sisk, who is currently in Marshfield, Vermont. Actually, she's right here in West Rutland um, for the, the next couple of months. Um, she is, um, has been an artist and educator for over two decades. Um, she is the creator of the artworks at Atelier Sisk, um, where she uh, presents her work. She went to Heron School of Art and Design in Indianapolis, and she attended Indiana University in Bloomington and the Florence Academy of Art in Italy. Uh, she's been an artist in residence at the um, St. Gaudens National Historic Site for two seasons. Uh, she was the recipient of a 2013 National Sculpture Society's Dexter Jones Award for Bar Relief. Um, she is the 2015 recipient of the Gibbons Prize for New England Sculptors. Um, she's attended as an artist in residence, the first ever, at the historic Governor John Langdon House. Um, she has been a, a, an instructor at the Carving Studio, working um, primarily in clay. Um, she's also been uh, an artist in residence for the commissioned work that's being done for the Rutland Sculpture Trail. Um, she's completed or she's completed three models so far that are then enlarged in um, three times enlarged in marble. The first one was Anne's story um, completed in 2018. Paul Harris, which was just installed and dedicated last September, who was the founder of the um, Rotary International. She is, uh, she also did the Julia Dorr, who is the founder of the Rutland Free Library. And she is currently working on Ernie Royal, who used to have a restaurant in Rutland, which was a, a, a real um, valued restaurant and um, uh, just a, a wonderful, he and, uh, he and his wife had run for many years until um, they passed away. Um, so at this point, I would love to introduce our, our speaker, Amanda Sisk, who is right. Yep, you're all set. Terrific. All right. And Can you hear, hear me all right? Yes. Welcome to everybody and happy Earth Day. I have decided to focus on my journey with relief sculpture this evening. So we're going to be looking at my initial influences, my first attempts, and then pieces that were created in artist residencies and through sculpture commissions. For those of us who may be tuning in tonight who don't know what bas relief sculpture is, I'd like to take a moment to define that before we go through the slides. Bas, B-A-S, is a French word that means low. So we're talking about a kind of sculpture that doesn't project very far out from its surface. I like to use the example of a coin when I explain bas relief to people for the first time. So you can think of a quarter, a nickel, a dime, or a penny if you're out of the United States or have a different preference, another coin. And the images on a coin, portraits, plants, animals, buildings, lettering, these all have slight volume to them. They are raised forms. They catch light. They also have recessed planes that are in shadow. But when you hold a coin up to eye level or you run your finger across it, you realize how very flat the images are. So in ball relief sculpture or low sculpture, you have a wonderful tension between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional worlds. That's what appeals to me. And I am self-taught in bas relief. I've never taken a class. I am only able to teach what I've learned by doing. And it's somehow become the core of the work I do for myself and commissions, teaching and consultation. So we'll take a look at that. We can go ahead and go to the slides. Uh, 
Okay, we'll start here in Italy. This was home for some years on and off. Sculpture was a happy accident in my life. I discovered it towards the end of my undergraduate career. And I wound up teaching with the woman who was teaching me. So since that time, teaching sculpture and making sculpture have been interwoven. That's never changed or altered. When I was an undergrad, relief wasn't taught. When I came to Italy for the equivalent of my graduate study, it wasn't taught. So what I did is I went out into environments like the one pictured here. This is the Santa Croce church facade we see. I, for time, lived overlooking this particular piazza. And you can see over the doors there, there's some sculptural work. And we have in the foreground a fountain. It's very hard in Florence to not go out your back door and see artwork. It's everywhere. So I would wander around and touch what I could, almost as if I were blind, allowing my fingertips to be the eyes. In addition to things like building facades or fountains, I, I went to cemeteries. There are two cemeteries in Florence, another one in Venice that I was fond of going to. And there you have upright monuments that feature relief sculptures. So I could physically touch those monuments and begin to understand how those forms were made. You can go to the next slide. I never thought that I would leave Italy, but one day I did. And I flew into Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Being in need of employment, I walked into Laurel Hill Cemetery it's one of the few cemeteries in the United States to have a nat National Historic Landmark designation. It was founded in 1836 as a kind of outdoor sculpture gallery and botanical garden. So I would get there at five or six in the morning. Sometimes it would be dark, depending on the time of year, and open the gates to over 70 acres of sculptures, plants, and animals, which is a very special environment to have to oneself at certain times. In the center there is a marble figure, and the marbles in the cemetery are badly eroded from pollution. Marble is a softer stone, as some of you may be aware, and breaks down more readily than the granite. The obelisks around this figure are made of granite, so they retain crisper detail for longer periods of time. What look like shadowed areas on that marble figure, yes, there are shadows there, but the darkness you see is also the accumulation of pollution. One of the things I did in my job, I was development and programs coordinator, so I wore a lot of different hats for a nonprofit. One of the things I did was research the sculptures on the grounds and build programs around them. This was a time in my life where I taught infrequently and produced very little work, but still found a way to be in touch with sculpture. Let me go to the next slide. Sometimes people ask me about my art historical influences, artworks I admire, and I think it might be all the years in Italy, all the museums, all the wanderings outside. I just don't have many answers to those questions. What appeals to me, what I wonder about, what catches my attention is what is someone doing for humanity with their sculpture? And an example of someone who caught my attention in Philadelphia, my time there, is Frank Bender. I had, at this time in my life, gone to our sister cemetery, which is where the morgue was. And while there, I briefly learned how to reset features on the deceased. This is a service for the living. It helps people say goodbye to their loved ones in a way in which they recognize their loved ones. It's not something I ever expected to do with my sculptural skill set. And when someone I had met in Philadelphia learned that I was doing this, he arranged to take me to meet Frank Bender, who was giving a talk at a museum in Philadelphia. Frank popularized forensic sculpture. So I don't watch television, but I'm aware that there are crime shows that feature a group of people solving crimes and very often an artist is involved in that team. Nowadays there would be computer or digital applications but Frank did the real thing in the real world by sculpting. What would happen in his life is the FBI would give him a skull from a cold case and he would build up tissue depth on the skull 
and then he would make a portrait sculpture over that. It was said that Frank had a kind of extra sensing about these cases. He would be moved to add interesting extra details to his sculptures to help close these cases. Frank spent his career binding up some of the deepest wounds that human beings can know, uh, namely not understanding what happened to a loved one. He also founded the society. I'm not going to apply my smattering of French to pronouncing this name or looking at the word that starts with the letter V. This is the name of a Frenchman who moved in the criminal world and became one of the first modern detectives. Frank and his colleagues built this society that brought together some of the sharpest minds in our world in different disciplines to solve the cold cases and they did it pro bono. So that's another example of the use of his creativity to help other people. I met Frank when he was dying and I left Philadelphia not long after, otherwise I would have wanted to learn more about what he was doing. You can go to the next slide. I resigned from my position at Laurel Hill because I thought I was heading back to Italy and that didn't happen. I wound up caretaking for a family member in Houston, Texas. And once again, being in need of employment, I walked into a design firm and was hired to paint murals. Previously, I had taught myself to make small oil paintings with tiny brushes. Sometimes the brushes would consist of a single cat whisker, not plucked from a cat, but a donated or found cat whisker. And suddenly I was being handed a house painting brush, much larger, and was given just a number of days to cover an entire canvas. So this was a period of, of real stretching and growth for me. I signed a contract that prohibits me from sharing these canvases in my portfolio, and I didn't sign them either. The reason I'm sharing this one with you is because an article was written about how this particular mural was made and this image is available online as well. I call it the mosaic mural. So even though I didn't get to go back to Italy, I felt I was in Italy. This reminded me of walking across mosaics in the Pompeii Sorrento area where I lived for a few times. And what you don't see in the image is a vast network of vinyl that is stretched across the surface of the canvas. And everywhere the vinyl touches is going to become grout. What I'm doing is mixing up paint very thickly and everywhere I apply the paint, that's going to become a raised tile. So another reason I was happy working on this mural is that I was in that two-dimensional and three-dimensional world all at once. You can go to the next slide. This is a detailed view of the finished mosaic mural. The vinyl's been removed and you can now see the grout between the tiles. You can't quite make out how raised the tiles are. And a rag was dipped in the dirty paint water, which was purplish brown and applied to the entire canvas to give it an antiquated look. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. At that same time of painting murals, I found a dead cicada, I love cicada, and I made a relief tile, which you see here. You can also see the influence of the painting. We made things called sample boards in the design firm. So if someone wanted a faux finish in their home or their business, they would have these different samples to choose from. And I, I found myself doing that with this relief. The upper left corner is verdigris. You may have seen this happen on metal sculptures in the public, streaks of blue and green running down bronze, which I find very beautiful. The one to the right of that, my favorite, is simply water and charcoal dust. The bottom left corner is shellac, and next to that is shoe polish. The image is called imago, which means image. Next slide. My next relief was an ornament for Christmas and it was and is a partridge in a pear tree. So a word of caution, if you ever make a partridge in a pear tree, someone may ask you about two turtle doves, three French hens, four calling birds, you can go to the next slide, for five golden rings. So five years on, I'm still making ornaments. 
And for the 12 days of Christmas song, we usually see jewelry for this part, for the five golden rings. But in, in doing some research, I realized the rings might refer to the rings around pheasants necks, which continues the bird theme for the first few pieces of the song. So I found a pheasant farmer and I went into a pheasant enclosure to look at the birds to make this particular relief. Over the years, I established two standard finishes. On the left, I call that one antique. In the middle is verdigris. And then I would develop a third limited edition finish just to keep things fun for myself and for the people who collect the ornaments. And go to the next slide. Approximately 10 years on, this is nine ladies dancing. For me, the figures are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So we're looking at love, peace, joy, forgiveness, self-control, and so on. When I was designing this, I knew I needed something round to fit all the figures. And I had been staring at a yogurt cup and my grandfather, who's a scientist and a musician, so logical and intuitive, he walked by and he didn't ask a question. He made a statement and said, what about a bell? And that is what this became. I was very happy to make a musical instrument as a former musician myself. And I learned a new technique for me called slip casting to be able to make these hollow. Nine of them in the terracotta and porcelain were recently exhibited at Ava Gallery and Art Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire, where I had a show called Sacred Encounters with my former students. And one of the very beautiful things about that exhibition is that we had a dancer come in to do a performance for the opening reception. She was the bridge between the gallery interior and the public standing outside the large windows looking into the gallery because of the pandemic. And she took recordings of the bells and worked them into her performance, which I think resonated with myself and other people because bells throughout cultures and areas of the world are seen as uplifting and cleansing and they're used in sound therapy so even outside of spiritual practices they are helpful to people. Next slide. All right we're going to look at some artist residencies and they've all been at national historic sites a little bit like Laurel Hill Cemetery being continued here. The first major residency I served in was St. Gaudens National Historic Site Artist Residency. It used to be the Department of the Interior that did the hiring. So the FBI does a background check, you get fingerprinted, they talk to the neighbors of your neighbors, and it's a little unusual as an artist to be in a position like that. Preference used to be given to veterans, which I'm not. I applied for three years and I was going to give up when my twin sister encouraged me to apply one more year. That's the year I was hired. When other sculptors write to me about this job, that's something I try and um, encourage other people to do as well, to not give up, to keep applying because this is a very, very special place and a special position. Augustus St. Gaudens is a master, was a master of bas relief sculpture. He was a celebrity in the late 1800s to the early 1900s and was a magnet for other artists in different disciplines. So in Cornish, New Hampshire, where the historic home and studio of St. Gaudens is located, um, an artist colony sprung up and has a very rich history to this day. All of my residencies have involved quite a bit of teaching. I taught more than one workshop per week and the studio was open to the public almost always. So the evenings were when I, I did the work for myself and there's no light pollution at this site. One can imagine being with St. Gaudens and his loved ones and colleagues in his day and age. So I don't have many pictures from this time period in my life and encourage you to look up the site and to go visit if you can. The gardens are beautiful, the sculptures are set among the plantings. It's, it's just really, really lovely. We'll go to the next slide. This is Ranger Zuleika. Uh, I started by doing portrait heads. We've seen the gaps I had in sculpture while I was in other jobs and I went back to what was comfortable. I understood portrait heads from my training and rangers, volunteers, would compose for me, sometimes for workshops, sometimes just on breaks 
that was the case with Ranger Zuleika. This is the only photograph I think I still have of the studio interior where we see Zuleika. The studio is called the Ravine Studio, overlooks a ravine. And it was a little bit like being in a tree house. You can see a window behind the sculpture it had two large casement windows that would swing out and all the fresh air would come in. It's, it's a beautiful space. Ranger Zuleika's portrait went to be exhibited in London. Um, a gentleman named Tom modeled for the piece in the lower right corner. That piece is called Lifeguard. And eventually at some point I realized maybe this was my opportunity to make a proper relief sculpture, meaning something beyond a tile or an ornament because I had these reliefs by St. Gaudens to study. So we can go to the next slide. This is a piece I made, it's entitled The Rat. A young woman named Claire, who was working at St. Gaudens, modeled for this piece. We did a photo shoot on the porch of St. Gaudens studio, minus the rats. There were no rats present at that time. It would be years until I would read the words of St. Francis of Assisi that sum up what I was feeling when I made this piece. And he said that if there are any creatures that we will exclude from love, we as human beings will do the same thing to our fellow human beings. I find that to be true. And the rat in particular is an animal that not many people are comfortable with. I read studies at this time about rats to, to learn more and to change my own mental landscape and belief system about this animal. And rats, have a great capacity for compassion, for example. I also thought about the names we call each other as human beings, and I won't say any of these out loud. You can probably come up with a list fairly rapidly. We use the names of animals to denigrate each other, and I, I didn't like that and was working with that at this time. In Claire's lap is a mirror. School children thought it was a giant wheel of cheese. They had their interpretations of what they were looking at. It was always meant to be filled with a reflective surface. So when the viewer approached it, where you would see the reflection of the rat, you would actually see yourself. So you are the rat. I am the rat. At this point in my life, I was understanding more and more not only how interwoven we are as human beings, but also with the natural world. We can go to the next slide. One of my former students encouraged me to exhibit the rat in the Ava exhibition. And when I looked at the piece, which is now some years old, I saw my imperfections as we often do as artists and didn't initially say yes, but I thought about it. And then I realized, oh, maybe this is the time I can use to put in that reflective surface. So thanks to that suggestion, I finally finished this piece in a sense. And on Valentine's Day, someone had given me a scrap of paper. I think it came from around flowers and that's what I was using to test out the reflection for the first time. Next slide. Just sharing a few practices that came out of each artist residency because they feed into the next artist residency or the next project. And something that I discovered at St. Gaudens, I call the Bozzetti. If you've heard the word maquette, which is French for a small study for a larger intended sculptural endeavor, Bozzetto is the Italian equivalent of that word. Bozzetti is plural. I think it's a playful word and these figures are playful, so that's why I use that term. This is a one that was made in the last three years. They're quite small in scale and this is how it works. I take a lump of clay, I give myself one hour and 95% of the time I don't look at anything and I try and let the clay become what it wants to become. So you can go to the next slide. This is the first one I made. I did a little more work on it, made a mold and a cast. It's called Refuge. For those who are with us tonight who don't know what a mold is or a cast is, I can explain it with an ice cube tray. If you think about an ice cube tray in your freezer, that's the mold. It has these negative cavities in it. What comes out of the negative cavities are positives, in this case, ice cubes. 
those are your casts. And go to the next one. Here's a selection of Bozzetti. And there are consistent themes to these. We've already seen the cicada and the rat and the birds. Animals show up here too. So just in this selection, we have butterflies, we have deer, we have a rabbit, we have a horse. We also have plants showing up in at least three of these images. In the center, you see where the IV is, there are some wires. I sometimes keep handfuls of wires or sometimes sewing pins or needles to add a little more structure to the little studies. Clay is not going to hold that, that shape, so it helps just be able to grab something sturdy from time to time. Next slide. Nostos is a Greek word for homecoming. And this is another example of a bozzetto that I finished a little more, made a mold, and made casts of. I continue to sell this piece even when it's not visible in the public eye. Someone tells someone else and it, it's requested. And one of the reasons I keep making it is because people share with me their stories of trauma when they purchase this particular piece. Sometimes it's the death of a child. Sometimes it's chemotherapy. Sometimes neither of those associations are involved. And when I first started selling Nostos, I gave options for the kite you see there. People could purchase a frayed kite or an intact kite. And I don't have any memories of anyone purchasing an intact kite. I think that this piece speaks to people who have been torn like that kite. And, and yet they get up each day. So this has remained special for me because when I wanted to ease out of my art career a few years ago, people showed up and they spoke to me about this piece. I can go to the next slide. There are relief bozzetti. Some of them are simply drawings on the surface of, of the clay. They're even lower than this image. They don't read well as a group. I chose only one to show you. It's called Fear Not. And rabbit, as well as bear, shows up in my work quite often. Next slide. Here we are at the Governor John Langdon House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. A New England organization had consulted with me about my artist residency experiences as they were building an artist residency here. And I didn't understand at the time that I would be the first person to be in this position. So I was able to inhabit something tailor-made for the health of the artist. I was very happy. There was a good work-play balance. The artist was well compensated, taken care of. And another layer of happiness had to do with the staff. They were wonderful. They, they remain people who are, are very much held in my heart as well as the neighbors and, and people who just come into the studio, which is out of our view in this image. It's behind the tree on the left, a little carriage house. Go ahead and go to the next image. Governor John Langdon was what we call one of our founding fathers, and he is considered by some to be the creator of the U.S. Navy. There's a wonderful Black Heritage Trail in Portsmouth. And the Langdon House is a stop on that trail, which I encourage you to explore if you go to Portsmouth and not to be comfortable, to unlearn and to relearn. Governor John Langdon did speak outright against slavery in his correspondence. And he seemed to have moved increasingly to actually living that out in his life. He employed freed black men and women, including a man named Cyrus Bruce. And there are interesting stories people would share with me. Um, for example, there was a young woman, Black, and enslaved by the Washington family. And she escaped George Washington's family and made it to Portsmouth. Whereupon somebody helped her to further safety. And the Langdon House was the destination in Portsmouth. George Washington visited there too. I like to think that Cyrus Bruce and Governor John Langdon and others helped that young woman. For me, this was one of the hardest portraits I've ever made because I look at a ship and I see war, I see power, I see greed, I see the slave trade, I see middle passage. 
I see stripping the land of its natural resources. I see taking the land from our indigenous people. And I even see the role of the church and its complicity in some of those evils. So I did what I always do, a research for every portrait and held the whole person, light and shadow. Go to the next slide. I went off site quite often, as happy as I was on the Langdon grounds. So people would tell me what to go see and do. There's a Navy presence to this day in Portsmouth. So someone had told me there's a replica ship out on the horizon, go, go to the water and, and see it. That is certainly a ship like the one that Langdon would have built as a shipbuilder. I went to where Langdon was born, where he was buried, went to look through his papers. Um, but things like these, going into the natural landscape, uh, I especially enjoyed that part of this residency. I'll go to the next slide. This is what a relief looks like when I first started. Drawing is very much a part of sculpting for me, whether it's a relief or in the round. When I studied in Italy, we drew half the day and sculpted half the day. He looks a little stern here. He's going to mellow out in the next slide, which we can go to. This looks more like the Governor John Langdon you might see in one of the few paintings we have of him. In the upper right corner are white pine needles from the white pine tree. The white pine tree is a very tall tree. It's used in the masts of ships. And these trees used to be stamped with the king's mark. They belonged to the king in England. And the tree figures in the early parts of the Revolutionary War because some people decided those trees no longer belonged to the king of England. So I was working with the pine needles, not because they evoked war and all the other things I've already listed, but from a Native American standpoint, this was a point in my life in which I was realizing I not only had Revolutionary War heroes in my ancestry, but people had told my twin and myself for years that we were Cherokee and we did some investigating and realized this, this might be true. And for the Native Americans, the white pine was not about those things. It was a tree of peace. You can go to the next image. I think I was trying to stamp all these issues that were coming up with peace. And you can see this sort of wave of the white pine needles that I, I put in here going back to Langdon's face, almost wanting to turn back time and at the same moment go forward from this time period. This is the piece at probably 90% of the way complete in the clay. We'll go to the next image. I've stayed double the amount of time I intended at each residency I've been in for good reasons. And the reason I stayed at the Langdon House is we decided to take the portrait all the way to bronze, which has more steps involved. And the idea was to sell the bronze to raise funds for future artists in residence at the Langdon House. This work was done at the Green Foundry in Maine. There's a school on the grounds there where I've taught and sometimes the foundry will do classes too. So if you're ever in Maine and interested, it's a nice place to visit. And here we're doing the chemical reaction that's part of making a patina on a bronze. We're heating up chemicals and go to the next image. And this is a detail of the patina on the finished bronze sculpture. Next image. One of the practices that came out of my time on the grounds of the Governor John Langdon House is what I call found flora and fauna. So increasingly, I was working with whatever showed up in front of me. Part of this was trying to be more mindful about the materials I use in my art making. For years, I've worked with toxic materials. Those things do damage not only to one's nervous system, but also to the environment. And this is a stalk of a plant called Baptisia, also known as false indigo. And unbeknownst to me, in just a few months, I am going to encounter this very same plant hundreds and hundreds of miles south and use it in work there. This piece is called Wound Becomes Balm. And the plant's embedded in clay and there are other materials such as all natural walnut ink on the surface. We'll go to the next image. 
Here's an example of working with the animals that showed up. So people would walk their dogs. There was a neighborhood cat that would stretch out on the studio floor and a chipmunk that lived under the floor. And the grounds had several rabbits. I would sit with them in the mornings and the evenings. And unusual for a city, there's actually a little woods behind the Langdon house. And that's another place I would go. Um, so you've heard me speak about my feelings about trees and a little bit about land and natural resources. That's what's cropping up in, in this image. And science is showing us increasingly that as we encroach on wildlife habitat, we're doing things to ourselves as human beings too, uh, in terms of illness and other issues. The rabbit was not afraid <laughs> nor weeping as it looks with just a bit of green at its feet. I think it was just cleaning its nose when I took the pictures. Can go to the next image. Padre Island National Seashore is where I went after the Langdon House in terms of residencies. This was the first time in my life I went somewhere to do an artwork without a plan, aside from wanting to do a healing image. And I don't have time to share all the stories with you about this residency and how I was supported every step of the way in making that choice. It was, it was a truly remarkable uh, period of time for me as an artist. And the man who hired me, I think he really understood the creative process. In Italy, if I were to sit down with a sketchbook and start drawing, in moments I would be surrounded by Italians and they would say, maestro, if you were a man, it would be maestro. And they would want to see what you're doing. And sometimes in other countries, we don't have those attitudes about artists. So walking with the land, which is what I'm shown doing here, um, really made me feel as if I were back in Italy with the attitude my employer had towards that. He knew that even though no physical work was done for a while, I was definitely working. I'm wearing rubber boots because there are rattlesnakes and in the water we have jellyfish, we have stingray. Because of the time of the year I went, sometimes in the evenings the parking lot would empty out and it would just be me. This is a 70 mile stretch of barrier reef island, I think the longest in the world. Um, and there are no trees. So not only do you have the immensity of the sky and the awesome immensity, terrifying immensity of the ocean, you have the wind, which I'm listening to right now around someone else's space here. I think the wind showed up in the finished sculpture as well. It was always in my ears. Sometimes at night, the moon would make a path in the water and I would force myself to walk into the ocean at night too, to have that experience. You can go to the next image. As I walked with the land, I was surprised by what caught my attention. I thought it would be first and foremost, the plants and the animals. And the human-made marks were extraordinarily beautiful to me. This is one of many tire tracks that I took pictures of, and there are elements of relief in there. We'll go to the next image. Bottle caps, very fishy smelling bottle caps. It's not that the Texans don't care about their park. I saw so many people picking up plastic. What happens on the island has to do with the currents in the Gulf. They're arranged in such a way that a massive amount of plastic can show up at certain spots on the island. So I started pocketing these and go to the next image. And there, there we have an example of the natural world. Padre Island National Seashore protects five species of sea turtles, some endangered. And what would happen in the colder months is they would become cold stunned uh, which would threaten their lives. So there's a special team and a rehabilitation place on the island where they take the turtles. And when they're feeling better, they re-release them. And often the public will be invited to those re-releases. That's where this photograph was taken. I promised the man who hired me that there would be a sea turtle in the finished sculpture. I think he took this picture. Next image. This is just a little glimpse of my very early brainstorming, my gathering of things. You can see the natural and the, the human made being put together. At this point, I knew I wanted to make an image about transformation that was going to contain things we consider toxic, like the plastic I was picking up and the natural things I was responding to. For me, what I call divine spirit or God, I see that force as the ultimate recycler. 
So any mess we've made, if handed over in the right spirit, can be transformed. So that's what was going on within me, in part, as I was thinking about the work. I took the plastic lids, I'm looking up the upper right corner here, turned them over, poked a hole in them, and I'd set them on the marks in the sand I like, and I would pour plaster through the lid and start to take impressions. I would also take the sand and mix it with lime to create the ground for fresco painting. The pigments for fresco painting are all natural. Um, you grind them up. And in the lower right corner, those are speckled crab shells I had been picking up and I was starting to design these different motifs that we're going to go ahead and see in the next slide, I believe. These are the 12 motifs that I eventually developed. They speak to different areas and experiences had on the island. They feature plants and animals I encountered. They also have spiritual symbolism that I hope is somewhat universal and uplifting for others who look at the final sculpture. In the second row, the middle one, the third image in from the left, there is our Baptisia plant that we saw at the Langdon house. Next to that, that is not my design. The person who taught me fresco, I invited to design one of these. And he did a lovely job. That is a flower that is called by many different names. I chose to call it the fire wheel. And to the left of that is the sea turtle that I promised. You can go to the next slide. Long ago, I took a class in astronomy and I didn't understand most of it. What I remembered was trying to understand and appreciate the expanding of the universe that is always happening. And I wanted that same feeling visually of expansion in my final sculpture. One of the ways I set out to achieve that was to make what I called the babies. So I had many different bottle caps and lids. I didn't want to paint say 50 deer portraits, like the one in the upper left corner. That would be enormously time consuming. And I'd already doubled my stay at the park because of this project and how much time it took. So that's with, where I developed the smaller caps and they contribute a sense of metamorphosis, expansion and transformation. Each motif has that, there are just four shown here. I'll go to the next slide. This is the finished sculpture. I had thought there would be 200 individual artworks, reliefs, and fresco paintings. We all lost count to over 900. <laughs> putting this together was like putting together a big puzzle. I'm so grateful to have help during some late nights. Because of walking the land during off season and in an intentionally solitary manner, because my workspace was in an office uh, on the island, I didn't interact with people as much as I might in other residencies unless I had a program. So the real interaction came when the piece was being assembled. People saw the galaxy, they saw the cosmos, they saw seashells, they saw the hurricane, they saw Fibonacci spiral. But the most beautiful thing someone communicated to me was they indicated their skin and we're very close to Mexico. The island goes all the way down to Mexico. We have a Hispanic population and they have their own racism they face. And this person indicated their skin and said to me, I am in your sculpture. You put me in your sculpture. And that one comment was worth all the work. This piece one is for every animal, every plant and every person. So we can go to the next slide. One of the practices or the desires that came out of my time on Padre Island was to do more contemplative work. For me, this means doing work in a prayerful manner that is not about a polished end product, more about the process. This piece, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to speak about in depth. There was a recorded talk this month about it, so you can find that online later after they've edited it. This is St. Francis of Assisi with five male hummingbirds. I made it in January of 2020. It was exhibited in London and then again recently at Avon. Go to the next slide. I think we have enough time to look at some of the Rutland Sculpture Trail commissions. I've become more and more cautious about the portraits I take on because 
Well, it's similar to a writer. A writer might live with their characters or an actor with someone they're embodying. And more and more that's become the case for my portraiture. And I've worked with portraits since I was 16 or 17. I give up so many of the hours of my life and carry them so closely to me, especially with the research I do. And the first opportunity to do a portrait in a very public way, I've never had a drive for public sculpture. It comes again through teaching, uh, teaching at the Carbon Studio and Sculpture Center. It's Anne Story, who was a Revolutionary War heroine and her son Solomon was worked into the composition. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go very in depth, but there will be a talk on May 7th for another organization specifically about the Rutland Sculpture Trail and these pieces, if you're interested. When, when I made this piece, my colleagues, Evan and Taylor, uh, they visited me while I, while I was doing the clay model and I was in a one room yurt. I was living a little bit like a pioneer woman, like Anne Story. So I had a wood burning stove, no electricity, there were solar lamps, no running water. I melted snow and drank it in the winter and a porta potty down the road. In fact, I, I had been reading about how Anne's husband and their son Solomon had survived being surrounded by wolves. And in the woods, I knew I was being stalked for two days. I had ruled out human, I thought it was a black bear. And I found myself surrounded by a pack of coyotes one evening around dusk. And I was able to use some of the Anne story research to respond to that experience. And no coyotes were, were hurt, but I, I did do things like build a huge fire and bang pots and pans together and, and talk to the alpha coyote. I looked right at that particular animal and, and let him know I wasn't for dinner. You can go to the next slide. This is the finished marble by my colleagues, Evan Morse and Taylor Apostle. They always make my work better, in my opinion. They add details I didn't have. I think it was Taylor who put in the wood grain on the cabin wall there. So please um, look for the link for May 7th if you're interested in learning more about this piece and we can go to the next slide. The next Rutland Sculpture Trail piece I did the design for was the Paul Harris Monument. And Paul Harris was the founder of Rotary International, which I'd seen the symbol for and knew the name of, but I did not understand the scope of the work that Rotary International does. And this is a good example of how the concept sketch doesn't always translate into the finished work. The finished work is simply a portrait bust of Paul due to copyright issues. Initially, there was relief and there were six wheels for the different aims of Rotary International for thousands of people during Paul Harris's life and since these aims have, have radically improved life. So those aims include peacekeeping, things like literacy, uh, clean water and sanitation, economic development. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. This is the finished marble by Evan Morse uh, being installed. And again, if you'd like to learn more about this, we will talk next month. Next slide. The third piece for the Rutland Sculpture Trail that I did the design for is the Julia Dorr Monument. And Julia Dorr was a philanthropist, poet, a novelist. She championed women, helping women to rise out of poverty. So for research, I read her poems and her books and her travel guides. I walked a seven day pilgrimage in England following some of her footsteps for those travel guides. And ultimately I chose to illustrate one of her specific poems on the front and the back of her dress. We're looking at plants and animals that are native to Vermont. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. The poem is called Over the Wall, and in the poem, a young girl goes into the woods and exists in total harmony with the plants and animals she finds there. Nature was the dominant theme in Julia's work, um, as well as her spirituality and the emphasis on what I would call the divine feminine, the, the spiritual, physical, emotional, entire health of, of woman. 
So she and clay was one and a half times life size, was created in a Houston garage in the middle of the summer during the pandemic. And the heat index was over 100 degrees plus the humidity. And one of the things that kept me going aside from someone giving me a steady supply of Gatorade is the sheer number of creatures that came into a garage in the suburbs. So I had a rattlesnake, that was the only one not living, sticking out of the wall. And I lived with the hornet's nest uh, above me. And then all these tremendous visitors came in, families of opossums, different birds, lizards, and mostly winged things, and an extraordinary number of frogs and toads. I, I didn't know that many existed around one house in the suburbs. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. The winged things would often land on the clay while I worked. And I don't know if it's because they were drinking moisture or if it was cool to them in the heat. So I worked very slowly, not, so not to hurt them and also because of the heat. This is the back view we're looking at. Cropped out uh, would be the nest with eggs and some violets, but we see a luna moth and a chrysalis and the Vermont state bird holding hemlock in its beak. And go to the next slide. I made the mold in Texas so I could fit it in two pieces in a vehicle and drive it north to the carving studio in Vermont. And that's where I cast in plaster and we assembled the two halves. You can see at her shoulder there's an overlap. One of the pieces warped and Tom, who works at the carving studio and sculpture center, helped me quite a lot in trying to put that together because then it gets handed off to this case in this case, Evan and Taylor, again. You can see Evan's work in the background. There's Paul Harris, my plaster model that he's translating into his marble carving. They've started working on the carving of Julia. And now that the temperatures are warming up, um, Evan and Taylor will pick up this work again. And I'm very excited to see what they do with the braid and all the details. Yeah, so much. So you can go to the next one. And it became quite popular, the trend spread. During the Industrial Revolution, this is the urban areas became increasingly crowded. Rural workers seeking employment. Can you hear me? And their accommodation wasn't great. They didn't necessarily have the cooking seats or equipment. This is the, the piece I'm currently working on, yeah, which is the Ernie Royal Monument. And Ernie Royal was the first Black restaurant owner in Vermont. He faced racism in Boston as he was trying to fund his restaurant, and he came here and built it. She worked with a building that was already constructed. I asked that his wife, Willa, could also be in the composition because I think there's a great love story there. She was a waitress, he was a dishwasher, and they built this incredible life of generosity, hospitality, and mentoring. I have figures around Ernie to speak to the mentoring. Ernie and Willa left their entire estate to helping, the language in the articles was minorities, so people of color and women to achieve what they want in the culinary world. And I had had strong feelings about their generosity of heart, just looking at photographs and reading old articles. And one of the things that has been loveliest about working on this model People have been sharing their stories about the times they met the royals or went to the restaurant, which no longer exists. And they did wonderful things for so many people and continued that after their deaths. I also have chefs in my family and I've worked for chefs in my creative career. This is an incredibly demanding field. And Ernie knew, I read his writings about this, you had to give it your all not only with your work ethic, but in terms of genuine care. People can feel that when they come into a restaurant, they can feel the level of hospitality and their restaurant Royals Hearthside was very popular. And I think it's because of their attitude and the attitude that they fostered in their restaurant. You can go to the next image. This is the model underway. Um, figures being mapped out, and we've already talked about bar relief. I'd like to point out two other forms of relief that we're seeing here. And sometimes visual art terms overlap with musical ones. So where you see the table and chairs, 
that's called alto relief. You can think of an alto instrument or an alto singer. The idea is that the forms are almost in the round and hopefully the people who encounter this monument can sit at the table, they can actually sit in the marble chairs, and that's to speak to the code of hospitalities that, that the, um, the royals lived out in their lives and fostered. The figures in between the very low relief and the alto relief in the front, some of them would be what is called mezzo relief, and mezzo is Italian for half. So you can think of a mezzo soprano, for example. It's midway between something very low and something very high. This is probably the first artwork I've ever worked on that features ball relief, mezzo relief, and alto relief. So I'm, I'm still playing a little bit with the forms to, to make it work for the carving end of the project. I'll go to the next slide. This is just a close up of some of the portraits as they're just starting, and they look so cheerful. That hasn't changed. Sometimes, Carol, I think, can testify to this. Sometimes the artist gets into their clay portraits emotionally. I've seen this with student work too. When I worked on Julia Dorr, sometimes she looked terribly angry. I think it was the heat. And luckily she doesn't look that way in the finished piece. But from the get-go, there's been a real sense of good cheer in these portraits, which I'm enjoying. You can go to the next slide. This is just a view that shows you the eagle, which I had read Ernie talking about, he considered it their mascot. They had eagles inside the restaurant and outside of the restaurant. It's positioned over the service window in a way I saw it in a vintage postcard. So this, this will be part of the composition as well. The plan is to be done with the clay and hopefully have a plaster model ready in June to move into the carving phase. So with that, if we have time for any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Amanda, your uh, your your piece down in Texas is just amazing. Were all those circles from bottle caps? Yes, they were. And very often people didn't understand when I would talk about bottle caps or, or lids, which told me we did a good job of transforming them. And then sometimes I was surprised, for example, we were giving a talk in Portsmouth and someone came up and touched one of those pieces, the finished pieces, and said, that's my gelato lid. They knew exactly where that lid came from. I wouldn't have known. So I had two ends of the spectrum. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I, I did catch, where is it displayed now? It is still at Padre Island National Seashore. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Hi, Amanda. My name is Derek. Um, I just I have to leave soon, but I wanted to hang around long enough to tell you the story, which I think you'll love. When you when going all the way back to the the rat, um, several years ago, I happened to speak with uh, Peggy Mason. She is head of the Mason Lab at the University of Chicago, and at that time, ever since I just looked up at my phone, they the Mason Lab at the University of Chicago studies empathy and helping behavior in rats. And uh, she said, so I'm setting up. And she looked at me and she said, they have it. So I just wanted you to know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, Amanda, I am just so floored at what you do and how you go about it. You know, the research you do and the incorporation of the the natural elements and, you know, on Julia Dore's robe is just so beautiful and elegant. You just have this amazing ability to, you know, grasp and incorporate so much meaning, so much warmth, so much compassion. 
I just really appreciated listening to your stories and your in details and information and want to thank you. Thank you. Mm. I also think, Amanda, that the, um, the way that you allow time for, for the inspiration to happen, I mean, it, I, I know personally by watching all the artists, it really does take time to figure out what you're going to, how you're going to say it, what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's in our, in our, daily lives, it's very hard to do that. So the fact that you've, um, you've made that the center, you know, to, to make uh, those choices and give it the time that it needs, I think is really only possible in an artist's life. I mean, I, I know the teaching and um, even the commissions are, are, you know, have parameters that you don't, don't set, but I just, really admire the fact that um, you utilize that time and respect the, you know, the process. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to watch. Can I ask about the, the piece that you're doing now, the, um, the restaurant scene? When you were commissioned to do that, were you given free reign? I mean, you're, the fact that you're doing the bar relief and the alto relief, that's, that's quite a lift for the sculptors at the other end. Um, yes, so there is an ongoing dialogue back and forth between myself and the funders and the other artists involved. And because my background is in bronze and because of Italy and seeing Bernini, I have this idea that anything can be done. That's not always the case. You've just touched on a good point. So my colleagues, including Evan Morse, have been very gracious. They understand that that's where I'm coming from and they help change course or correct course with me a little so that we still have exciting challenges, but I learn what is possible. I've done so little carving myself that I, I come from a place of ignorance. So there is a real collaboration and I, I don't feel like I can't ask questions and people are very clear about coming back to me if something is absolutely not going to work. I'll just follow up the question with a comment. Um, I'm, this is Steve Costello. I work with Carol on the carving on the uh, sculpture trail and have had the, the great pleasure of getting to know Amanda a little bit and Evan and, and watch them work. Um, to the question, I think we often have ideas of what we think the, the piece should be um, in our eyes as we've fundraised for it and, and worked to find different people willing to fund these pieces. And invariably um, in the pieces that, that Amanda has worked on, she has brought dramatically more to the piece than we ever dreamt. And, and I think Julia Dore is probably the best example of that, but I think we're gonna see the same thing now with, with uh, the Royals. Um, you know, you, you talk about an author and you want a, a piece of art that represents that person. And, you know, look at most art in the United States and, and especially statuary art. There's a lot of really boring busts out there, quite frankly, and Amanda has, created a, a model that is just absolutely stunning. I mean, the model is a work of art um, worthy of being exhibited just like the finished product is. It's really quite incredible. And um, I'll, you used the word lovely earlier, Amanda, um, when you were talking about one of the pieces. And I actually was thinking that that, that perfectly describes your method and your way with people. It, it, you really are a beautiful person and it's been really a great pleasure to watch you work and get to see what you bring to these pieces. Thank you. I, while watching you speak, I was really struck by, can you hear me? I can, the wind is, is 
beautifully speaking too. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try to speak a little louder. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe it'll be uh, the wind and I together. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, so as as you were speaking, I was really struck by um, what other people had said. Also, like your your attention to the research and um, this compassion and. Uh, like very nuanced approach to these delicate, important things. Um, and, you know, li giving it time. And I think a lot of the time, I feel like there's this rush, 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 rush thing in our society. And there's also often not a whole lot of compassion. Um, and I was wondering, I'm sure you're con your contemplation um, and your spiritual path is helpful for not falling into all of that pressure. But I was also wondering if there's something about your approach to art making that, like, is the art making itself helping guard you against that? Or do you have to guard the art making against, or, or is this not even a problem for you? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, I have to guard the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I am, when I work on my own, my, my pace has become slower and slower and slower. And frequently, if it's just me with my creativity and spirituality, I am stopped multiple times per day just to recenter and to be with the divine. So to be in a workspace, in a working world, that's something I haven't done for a long time. I've worn a lot of hats, um, worked a lot of different jobs. But it's a bit of a shock sometimes, especially if you've been living as a hermit, to all of a sudden be in, in the working world again. And I think all of us as human beings are finding balance. I think that's a really key word for a lot of people, especially during the pandemic. And it's an opportunity, not a disappointment for me to work on that right now. And there are ways for us to be centered and peaceful and present in the midst of the storm. And sometimes that storm is the, a different work environment. So I hope that helps answer a little. Yeah. yeah thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, you said that you will be making, uh, I came in on the tail end of your, your presentation, so I apologize for that, but you said that you will be making a plaster cast of your clay model. I'm curious what will what will happen to that cast at at the end of that process or what's the next step after that? <clears throat> all right. So the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center has saved all the casts. It's like they have a little museum of them. You can see them on their grounds. Um and I'm not the best person to speak about this one of my carving colleagues would be but the plaster model, which is more durable than clay, is used to take points off of that go right to the stone. So I'm, I'm told it's tedious um, for many, but it, it's a very disciplined process of taking these little points off the plaster model and translating them to, to the marble, from the plaster to the marble, excuse me. What, what scale is that from? Oh. The, the pieces for the carving studio are often um, one third or one half. So the Royal Monument is one third life size. It will be tripled for the stone. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just wanted to say I really loved some of the pieces with um, integrating nature and like some of the different environments that you visited. Um, so I was sort of curious um, if there's a specific location that you connected with the most um, while you sort of like worked with different pieces. Material. No one's ever asked that. <sighs> I think, I think today it, it might be Padre Island. And initially that wasn't the case. When I first went there, I thought I might've made a mistake. 
when I was walking with the land, there were things I picked up on that were very hard for me, older things, contemporary things. And I called a friend who later helped finance that project. There was no stipend. I had no money at the time. I was completely taking a leap of faith. And he said, this is your opportunity to imprint that landscape with light. And that solves a lot of the discomfort I initially had. So just having discomfort isn't a bad thing. It can mean growth. It can mean looking at something that we need to look at. Um, and Padre Island, I mentioned there are no trees. I love trees. <laughs> and, and it was very, very hot. So I learned new ways to, to look at the land and to love it. It was very subtle. I spent a lot of time looking at the ground um, where I found those impressions and, and the toxic little bottle caps and everything else that came my way. So I think, I think it was Padre Island and so many people I met or who have seen the sculpture and written to me have a great love for that stretch of land. Even in all its subtlety, if you've gone somewhere very dramatic, um, lived in a country or city that's known for extraordinary natural beauty, and then you go to Padre Island, I find it beautiful, but it's incredibly subtle. And, and for some people, they might just see drab sand and no trees. <laughs> it's a little bit like being in a desert. And people go there at select times for that reason too. There are over 300 migratory bird species that go through. So some people go there just to see the birds, not the landscape, but the birds. Thank you. Welcome. If there aren't any more questions, uh, um, I want to thank you very much uh, uh, for the, the, the really inspiring talk. Um, we will have a recording of this, so if anyone is interested in it, we'll post it on our website. Um, and um, thank you all for coming. <laughs>